Hello students, we're going to do a combustion analysis problem today. This problem is a pretty typical type of problem for combustion analysis. I'll walk you through the idea of this and we'll also work the problem itself. We're told that we have a particular mass of unknown sample, but we do know that that sample is entirely composed of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. What you would do is you would throw that sample into a furnace and you would burn it in the presence of oxygen and you would see that you have that much mass of carbon dioxide coming off and you have this much mass of water. The goal, at least for part A, is to figure out what the empirical formula is for this unknown compound. Then in part B, this will be really quick. We're just provided enough information that we could move from the empirical formula to the molecular formula. So like we do so many times in chemistry, let's start with just trying to figure out what's going on. And I'm going to start with a chemical reaction to do that. Here's my starting compound. It's entirely carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But I don't know what sort of ratio of these elements we're talking about. That's fine. Those are going to stay as variables. Any sort of combustion reaction is always going to be combusting with molecular oxygen. And that's going to give us the products of carbon dioxide, if I had any carbon, which I do. And if I have any hydrogen, then we know that I also get water as a product. And so this is my reaction. I'm unable to balance it right now. And really balancing is a conservation of matter sort of idea. However many carbons I have on the left, I have to have on the right. So I can't balance it in the traditional way by putting the numbers in front with the stoichiometry, but you still use that sort of concept, that conservation of mass concept. So let's go in and label the mass of these materials that I have. I know I have 3.335 grams of this substance, some unknown amount of oxygen to begin with, 7.998 grams of carbon dioxide and 1.637 grams of H2O. Being that conservation of mass must hold, if I wanted to, I could immediately figure out what that question mark is, how much oxygen is required because the mass on the left has to be equal to the mass on the right. It turns out that's not a particularly important step for what I'm trying to find, so I'm gonna skip over it. But it is important to make the connection that my starting material that contains all the carbon and the hydrogen is getting split up, those things are getting oxidized, and I'm getting extra oxygens onto these things from this guy, and that's why the mass of this entire side on the right is going to go up. The strategy that we want to do is we want to figure out what mass of carbon do I have in this problem because whatever the mass is on the right, that's going to be the same mass that's right there over on the left of specifically carbon. Whatever mass I have of hydrogen is going to be the same mass that I have over here of hydrogen. Then what I can do is I can take this number and I'm going to subtract off those two masses that we were just talking about here and here, and that's going to give me the remaining mass that must be this oxygen. And if I know the masses of those individual components, then I can figure out what the empirical formula must be. So there's the strategy. All right, what mass of carbon dioxide am I talking about? Well, we could do this in a couple different ways. One, you could calculate what the mass fraction is of carbon in carbon dioxide and just multiply it by this 7.998 grams then you would rinse and repeat, do that for the water with hydrogen. I'm going to take a slightly different approach. It uses all the same information. I'm going to go to how many moles of carbon dioxide am I dealing with? And so over here, I would be dividing by the molar mass of carbon dioxide. And let's just go with some pre-calculated numbers here. So the molar mass of carbon dioxide is 44.01 grams per mole. And for water, it's 18.015 grams per mole. But if I'm just careful and I watch my units, 7.998 grams divided by this 44 number, it's going to give me 0 0.18173. That's moles of CO2. And I'm working my way to how many grams of carbon do I have. Before I can go to grams of carbon, I have to know how many moles of carbon I have. And this is pretty simple. There's one carbon for every one carbon dioxide. So I also have that same numeric value, mole of simply just carbon, that time not carbon dioxide. 
Then I'm going to multiply by the molar mass of just carbon, which is approximately 12, and I'll get 2.182 grams of carbon. This is going to be a little bit of a squeeze. I'm going to try to do water right next to it here. And this time my goal is to figure out what mass of hydrogen I'm going to have. So first, I need to take this initial information, I need to divide by the molar mass of water, and 1.637 divided by this 18 number is 0 0.09087, and that is mole of H2O. And then come back to carbon and see what we did. We took the moles of carbon dioxide and we figured out how many moles of just carbon are we talking about. Well over here I'm going to do the same but with hydrogen. So this is how many moles of water I have, but you'll notice that there are two hydrogens for every one water molecule. So I need to take that number and multiply it by two. So I have 0 0.1817, that's mole of specifically hydrogen. And then I can finish this off by multiplying by the molar mass of just hydrogen, which you know is just a little bit above one gram per mole. And when I do that, I get 0 0.1831 gram hydrogen. I'll say again that all of this could be done with the mass fraction information. My preference is to do it this way because I'm going to come back and use some of these numbers that are sitting here on the board. But the ones that are of most interest to me right now is that this is the mass of carbon and this is the mass of hydrogen. And given that I only am getting hydrogen and carbon from my starting material, I know that those masses must also be coming out of this initial unknown compound. Now there's still this oxygen involved and I don't know what the mass is of that, but we're going to find that right now. So we take the full combined mass, which is this front number given in the problem, and I'm going to subtract 2.182 grams of carbon and I'm going to subtract the 0 0.1831 grams of hydrogen. And that is going to give me 0 0.96906, carry out a few digits here, grams of oxygen. I'll, I'll do that so it's a little bit more clear that that's not some random zero sitting out there. So oxy, as in oxygen. So now notice that I have the mass of carbon, mass of hydrogen, and the mass of oxygen. I have all those components. To get an empirical formula, I need to not be dealing with mass, I need to be dealing with number of things. So it makes sense to take this oxygen number and do a conversion where I'm going to divide by the molar mass of just oxygen and that will give 0 0.06059 mole of oxygen. Okay, so now hopefully you can see why I personally prefer to use this method that I used. Because if we look at the writing that's already on this board, I have the moles of atomic oxygen involved in my unknown. Over here, I have the moles of carbon in my unknown. And over here, I have the moles of hydrogen in my unknown. I need those three numbers to just finish this off and figure out what is the empirical formula. So I'm going to clear some board space and then just grab these numbers again and kind of reorganize them. Here's the organized information. Again, I just yanked these numbers from what you saw before. The goal is to figure out what is X, Y, and Z in this molecular formula so that we can really finish this off. So the empirical formula remembers just the ratio of these things and it's going to be the lowest whole number ratio you can come up with. So here are the numbers for each of these guys and what you do is you always just divide by the smallest of the three. So that means I'm going to divide all of these numbers by this guy because that is the smallest of those three. So when I do that we can see that this is going to be exactly one. And up here, this is going to be approximately three. This is going to be approximately three. When you're doing this type of thing, it's not uncommon that sometimes you would get, you know, a 1.5 after this step. And you might have to do a little bit of readjusting so that you can get whole numbers. It worked out to entirely whole numbers for us off the bat. So this means that carbon, there's three of them. 
C3, hydrogen also has three of them, and oxygen is just by itself with the one. So that is my empirical formula. So there's the answer to this guy. So now you move on and we're really almost done with the problem. I say, oh, okay, upon further analysis, this molecular mass appears to be between 100 and 125 grams per mole. So what we need to do is we need to figure out this unit, this empirical formula unit, what is the molar mass of it? This is likely not the full molecule. So I'm going to take my 3 times 12 for carbon, 3 times 1 for hydrogen, and 1 times 16 for oxygen, and add all those together, and I would get 55.055 grams per mole. I am using more sig figs in that calculation than what I was just reading off, just in case you're doing this with me at home. So you can see one unit is this many grams per mole. Two would get me to approximately 110 grams per mole. Three is too much. That would be 165 grams per mole. So you can see that we need this times two. This is the one that's going to work for us. So the molecular formula is C6H6O2. And that is the answer to part B. Ideally, you recognize that the main principle I was using was conservation of mass. And it's just a little bit of a puzzle trying to figure out how much of this element there must be compared to this situation. Hopefully that made sense to you. And if it did, you should let your computer know.